Good morning, good afternoon, good evening students. Welcome to Skin Lesions PLM. So the best way to utilize this material would be to go along the PowerPoint slides and answer all the questions at your pace and pause at any point and of course refer to the DSA material. So there are about 50 multiple choice questions. Most of these are case scenarios but then uh, in the beginning there are some questions about just identifying the lesions because it is so important to be able to identify and describe the lesions correctly to be able to make the accurate diagnosis. And if you have any questions in the end, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to engage with you for any questions. So question number one is about identifying this lesion. It is on skin. It is a small lesion. It's bumpy. It's on the skin and it's asking, the question is asking what type of lesion it is. So the correct answer would be pustule because it is, it is, as you can see, it is raised, but it's not a papule because it is filled with something. It's not a vesicle because there is pus in it. It's not a macule because it's not flat and it's not a bullet because it's not very big. Question number two is identifying this particular lesion. So the correct answer choice in this case would be vesicle because it is small, it's fluid filled, it's clear fluid, and it is a vesicle. Therefore, it's not a papule because it's uh, filled with fluid, it's not a macule, it's not flat, and this and that. So you already know the answer. Question number three is asking about this particular lesion, which is on skin and it's on, on an extensor surface. So identifying this lesion uh, would basically mean that you need to look at it and see what are the characteristics. So it is uh, it is broad-based, it is hyperkeratotic, it's thick, it's scary, it's uh, slightly erythematous, and uh, if you ask the patient, it's quite itchy also. Um, the correct answer would be black. So it's not ulcer because there's no breakage, there is no telangiectasia, there is no excoriation, which is a secondary skin lesion, uh, which happens as a result of excessive itching. It is not a bullet because it's not fluid filled. So the correct answer is it is a plaque. Question number four is asking about this particular lesion. So this is a patient who's a male patient with uh, his face exposed, face exposed and uh, the answer choices are, of course, nevus, blister, plaque, and this and that. And the correct answer would be macule because it is flat, although it is a little bit hyperpigmented, so we can call it hyperpigmented macule, but it is a macule. Um, it is not erythematous, so the answer would be hyperpigmented macules. Question number five is about this particular patient who is um, exposed, uh, his back is exposed, it's a, it's a young child, and uh, the uh, the question is asking what type of lesion this is. So this is red, it's flat, and we can call it erythema because it's not nevus, it's not black, it's not blister, there's no fluid, there is no plaque, there is not there is no thickness or there's no scaliness, and there's no fissure or breakage in the skin, so we can easily call it erythema. Question number six is about this particular patient who's got uh, who's a female patient with her face exposed, and the question is asking what type of lesion it is. So there is, as you can see, it's flat and it's dark, so we, we will call it hyperpigmented macules. Question number seven is asking about this particular lesion and asking what type of lesion it is. And it's a very peculiar lesion. So we can see it's not hyperkeratotic, it's not thick, it's not scaly, it's not fluid filled. It is not hypopigmented necessarily. There is some redness to it. It's not hyperpigmented. So it is an erythematous macule. Question number eight is asking about this particular lesion and it is spread on the back of a patient and is asking what type of lesion this is. So you can see it is flat, so it is macule, not what type. It is hypopigmented because you can see that there is, uh, there is uh, uh, the skin is uh, hypopigmented, there is depigmentation in the skin in some areas. And although you can make a case and say that the circles or the borders of the circles are darker color, but those are just because the contrast color is lighter. So it is hypopigmented macules. And can you guess what type of disease it is or diagnosis it is? So it is tinea corporis or fungus infection. We'll get more into the diseases and specific conditions later on as we move forward. So question number nine is now a case scenario. So we're done with identifying the lesions. This case scenario is a, is, a, is a pediatric patient who is five years old. He's brought to the emergency room and he has specific characteristic features as described by the mother. So the patient has got fever, he's got some redness on the face, he's got strawberry tongue or red color tongue, 
and he's got some redness in his eyes also and mom reports that there is um, uh, the, the child is a little bit dehydrated and you also notice that so we move on to the next slide for this question and the question is asking what is the diagnosis so the diagnosis in this case would be uh, there are multiple uh, choices so let's move on to that so of all the answer choices the correct answer would be Kawasaki syndrome and why is it Kawasaki syndrome it's a pediatric patient under the age of five he's got redness on the face he's got fever he's got strawberry tongue or red tongue he's got cunning tribal injection or redness in the eyes and he's got uh, if you can see uh, clearly he, or if you ask the mom, he's got uh, loss of appetite, he's a little bit sick, he's dehydrated. So he's got quite a few features that are consistent with Kawasaki syndrome. As you can see, it is not a simple virus or benign virus rash because there are multiple features present. It's not parvovirus B19 because there is no slap cheek appearance alone. Uh, there are additional features present. It's not Lyme disease, there is no Lyme disease rash. It's not rheumatic fever because we don't see features consistent with Jones criteria. So therefore, the correct answer is Kawasaki syndrome and you can refer back to the DSA slide for this. The next question, question number 10 is asking what additional features are likely to be present to accompany these findings to make it the diagnosis of Kawasaki syndrome. So you may have splenomegaly, supraventricular, I'm sorry, supraclavicular lymph node enlargement, hyperpigmentation of the skin, cervical lymph node enlargement or dry itchy skin. So as we refer back to the DSA slide, the correct answer would be cervical lymph node enlargement. So although we did not mention it in the stem of the question, but uh, this is a feature of Kawasaki syndrome and the rest of the answer choices are just simply not correct because splenomegaly happens in mono, superclavicular lymph node enlargement occurs in the case of sometimes GI malignancies, hyperpigmentation of the skin is not a part of Kawasaki syndrome and dry itchy skin is also not a part of Kawasaki syndrome. Question number 11 is about treatment and management of Kawasaki syndrome. So the question is asking what medication you can prescribe for Kawasaki syndrome. It is one and the only perhaps syndrome in children where you can actually give aspirin. So the correct answer would be aspirin. So question number 12 is a patient who is 35 years old male. He went to Minnesota on vacation and he came back and now he's got a rash which is spreading uh, superficially and he's got uh, malaise and fatigue and joint aches and pains and now you're wondering what type of rash it is. So this was a erythema migrans or rash associated with Lyme disease and the question number 13 is how will you treat it? So as we know Lyme disease is treated with antibiotics. There is no role for steroid cream. You don't need to biopsy this rash. You don't even need to do a TB test. He just went to Minnesota. I didn't go anywhere else and you don't need to refer to dermatology. Question number 14 is asking what additional features could be present in this particular condition. So there is all kinds of wild symptoms present, possible but of course the patient uh, in this uh, particular scenario has arthralgias or joint pain so that is the correct answer. Heartburn is not associated with Lyme disease, mood swings, itching and weight loss are also not necessarily a part of Lyme disease although with loss of appetite in the long run some people may lose some weight. Question number 15 is a newborn baby or an infant who's brought to you by the mother and mother is very concerned in saying the child is not doing very well. He's got a rash all over his face, although he's happy, healthy, eating, drinking and sleeping. So when they're doing all of that, then you know what that means. So when you look at the patient's uh, appearance, it, he looks pretty healthy and you see the picture. He has a maculopapular erythematous rash on the face all over and it's a little bit weepy and oozy. So this particular question is asking what should you do? Well, there are multiple choices and you could tell the patient or patient's mom that yeah, we should admit him or we should isolate him or we can uh, prescribe some steroids or we can um, do like an antiviral treatment and this and that. But the correct answer would be that this is Aridema toxicum neonatorum. So although the name is very fancy and you can give it to the mom, but this is a very benign self-limiting condition and you don't need to do anything, just reassure the mom. The next question is a 39 year old female patient who is struggling at work because she just can't seem to be able to finish her work. She is extremely fatigued and when you look at her, she has a rash on her face and you can see the picture, it's a butterfly rash. 
So it's erythematous macule, which is on her face. When you look at her fingers, there is some discoloration. There is, uh, there is blanching when you actually do the exam. So the question is asking what type of condition she has. So there are multiple choices. So the first uh, choice is polymyalgia rheumatica. It couldn't be that because patients with polymyalgia rheumatica have pain in multiple joints, which are different from where uh, the pain is in lupus. Uh, the uh, this next choice is uh, lupus itself, and that is the correct answer. The, so the patient has systemic lupus erythematosus. She has a butterfly rash on face, which is very prototypical. She has joint aches and pains. She has photosensitivity. She also has cold intolerance. She has um, a blanching of the skin and exposure to cold, which is a sign of vasoconstriction that happens as a result of uh, the disease itself. Uh, she also has um, uh, fatigue and she's not able to perform daily activities. So as we know, lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus is a multi-symptom, multi-system disorder where there is inflammation all over the body and multiple systems are involved. There are many other sy sy uh, symptoms. There are lab findings. At least four out of 11 things have to be present if you refer back to the DSA. And although uh, there are prototypical examples present and your DSA would talk about it um, and all the exam questions will also pose uh, prototypical pictures, but um, uh, patients that you see in real world or real scenarios are not necessarily going to be prototypical. So it's always a good idea to look for this order because it is much more prevalent than we think. Uh, the, well, the next uh, answer choices are a bacterial infection, it's really not that, there is no fever, it's not acute. HIV, it's really not that, HIV doesn't show like this, there's no rash associated um, in the photo distributed areas. Uh, it's not contact dermatitis, come on, it's not that. The next patient is a 67 year old female who's got a rash on her skin. She's got dark spots on her face and also on her hands. And she's 67, she's got three pregnancies and she's got um, di uh, diabetes. She's also had eczema, uh, uh, but it resolved in her 40s. So the question is asking what type of rash it is and how would you describe it? So is it hyperpigmented macules or solar lenticle? That is the correct answer. Is it hyperpigmented macules or acanthosis nigricans, which you can see in um, diabetes mellitus, but that usually occurs in the folds, like for example, in the axilla or in the groin area, or is it hyperpigmented plaques or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation due to eczema? It's really not that because it's not uh, patient doesn't have eczema right now. Is it hyperpigmented patches uh, and early onset of basal cell cancer? It doesn't really look like that. The appearance is not consistent with basal cell. Is it hyperpigmented macules post pregnancy melasma? But she had pregnancies but long, long time ago. So it's not that. So the correct answer is A. So the next question is a 22 year old male who went to Florida, Miami. He spent some time at the beach and he's developed this rash. It's pruritic, it's very itchy, it's in his hands and feet. He's very concerned about it. He's got, he's used over the counter creams and emollients and it's just not getting better. And he's asking you, is it going to involve the rest of his body very soon? So the question is asking, uh, how would you describe this or how would you answer his question? So the patient is asking, uh, how, uh, what is causing this rash? So the answer choices are, it's hand, foot, mouth disease. Well, it's not that because that happens in children and that have, that involves hands, feet and mouth. The patient doesn't have any mouth involvement. Um, the next uh, choice is the rash is common in cold climate and it's caused by a fungus. So although we know it's caused by a fungus because it is a tinea pedis and tinea menum rash, but it's not in common in the cold environment. The answer choice is it's common in the humid environment and is caused by a fungus. That is the correct answer. So the correct answer choice is C. Uh, the next choice is if it is secondary syphilis. It's not that, we know it because secondary syphilis, although it causes rash on palms and soles, but it's not uh, consistent with the uh, syphilis. The next and the last uh, choice is the rash is self-limiting and treatment should be discontinued. That's not correct. The rash will spread and spread, so we have to continue to treat it uh, with the antifungal treatment. So this question is about this two-year-old male child who's brought by the aunt, and she says that she picked up the child to um, babysit, and the child had low-grade fever, slapped cheeks, um, so there's redness on the cheeks, 
and uh, she's worried that uh, th there is something going on. Uh, mom is with a boyfriend and um, so there is a little bit concern there and the question is asking what type of rash it is and what should be our reaction. So the answer choices are immediately notify the child protection services um, Well, for neglect. No, that is not the answer because this is not consistent with child abuse. Uh, mother, um, uh, call the mom to get more history because you can't really make the diagnosis. That is not correct because you can actually, uh, based upon the information you have, you can make the diagnosis, call the police, mm -hmm. no, not that. It's a bacterial infection, admit the child to the hospital. No, it's really not that. There's a low-grade fever, there's a rash, and it is really parvovirus B19 uh, because uh, that is what causes slap cheek appearance and uh, uh, we just need to assess hydration. Most children will get over it without any problem. Occasionally, some patients who continue to have the infection can develop a pure red cell aplasia or other complications, but we can monitor for them. So the correct answer choice is E. It is parvovirus B19, consistent with uh, this slap cheek appearance. So this is a loaded question with a lot of information. So this is a 19-year-old patient who is a basketball player. He's got a history of mono. He's come to see you. He went to Hawaii on a trip uh, for three weeks, and then he's got sick. He's got sore throat. He's got in the last four days. He's got uh, he couldn't practice because he's got multiple joint aches and pains. And there is a fake. Uh, there's a very faint rash that you can see here and it's macular, there is a low grade temperature, 101 or middle grade temperature. He's got a runny nose, nausea, headache, and his EKG is normal. So the question is asking, uh, how do you, when you evaluate the patient, how do you actually arrive at the diagnosis? So when looking at this patient's history, look at all the features, what features are sufficient to make the diagnosis of rheumatic fever. So as you can see, he's got multiple features and we just need to extract features consistent with major or minor criteria included in Jones criteria for making the diagnosis of rheumatic fever. So the answer choices are uh, sore throat, history of mono and nausea, that's not correct. Mono doesn't have to be present. Sore throat, malaise and fever, um, those are not necessarily parts of the, uh, the major or minor criteria uh, because although they can be present in rheumatic fever, but they are not included in major or minor criteria as such. The answer choice C is, uh, is, the, is the rash of edema marginatum, runny nose and fever. Although rash is, is a part of the criteria and fever is too, but runny nose is not. The answer choice D is edema marginatum rash, fever and arthralgia and that is, con is the correct answer. And then the last choice is fever, headache, normal EKG. Again, we know that is not a part of the Jones criteria. So this question is describing a rash in a, in a 27 year old female patient who says that she is a little bit concerned or quite a bit concerned because she's embarrassed, she can't feel short, she's developed this rash on her knees and extensor surfaces and she just can't go out, it's itchy, scaly and this and that. So uh, let's look at the rash. So here you are not necessarily making the diagnosis, although I'll tell you it is psoriasis and of course you already probably figured it out. But the question is asking how would you describe this rash to your professor when you're doing derm clerkship. So it is important to use your terminology correctly because that is how you will arrive at the diagnosis correctly and that's also how you will not cause any confusion. So the answer choices are that the patient has maculopapular rash, seen on psoriasis. Mm, no, it's not maculopapular. The choice a patient has white plaques as seen in pamphigus, it's not pamphigus. The patient is, got, is at risk for skin cancer, mm, no, not that. Patient has scaly plaques and these are on the extensive surfaces as seen in psoriasis, that is the correct answer. Uh, choice D and or patient has transient contact dermatitis, that's not the answer. So this question is describing a 53 year old male patient who's come to your office with bumps on his face. He's very concerned because he's got these lesions and they've been there for many, many years and they are got progressively worse. And uh, uh, now he's asking um, your opinion. So the question is asking, what is the best way to describe uh, this condition? So the first answer is, it's a benign condition, it's unfortunate, 
and it's characterized by numerous nodules. That is the correct answer. As you might have noticed, this is neurofibromatosis, which is described by multiple nodules on the face, all over the body, and these are uh, in the distribution of multiple nerves. These may become painful. They are usually benign. You do not cut them. You do not excise them because they will come back. Uh, there are cafe olive spots associated with it, and unfortunately, you can't really uh, do much about it. That is the correct answer if you refer back to the DSA. The next choices are it's basal cell carc carcinoma. It's really not that. Although these are small pearly lesions, but they are so many, it's not basal cell and it's been present for so many years. Um, this condition will resolve in the sixth decade of life. No, nowhere uh, we know that or see that. It is uncommon to see this condition in males. No, it's actually common in males or individual excision of such nodule will result in cure. That is also not the correct answer. So this question is if about a five-year-old male patient who's brought by mom and the child has, a, um, has multiple skin lesions of different sizes, different shapes in different parts of the body, but they are in groups. So they are crops of different vesicles or papules or macular lesions and mom is pregnant mom is expecting another child mom also has another a child at home who's developing similar lesions and she says that the child is uh, drinking soy milk and um, uh, her pregnancy is supposed to be she's expecting in about six months so the question is asking based upon these features what is the correct diagnosis so we know the the answer choice A, parvo virus B19, it's not that, there's no slap cheek appearance, bacterial infection, child is just not sick enough to have that, chicken box, that is the answer, groups of vesicles, macules, papules in the form of crops in multiple parts of the body and often you see different stages at the same time within three to five days of appearance of the rash and there is no other problem, there is some itching, there may be low grade temperature, but generally speaking, they, these children are going to look fairly healthy. So that is the diagnosis of chicken parts. And then siblings will also uh, contract it pretty quickly. It's not viral xanthem or benign virus reaction or uh, like a general virus reaction. It's not tinea versicular, we already know that. This question is asking what feature in this case is most consistent of or specific to the diagnosis of chicken parts. So the answer choices are lack of fever, that's not the answer because they may develop fever, crops of maculopapular and vesicular lesions in different parts of the body in different stages, answer choice B, that is the correct answer. Distribution of rash, mm, not necessarily. Mother's pregnancy, no, pregnancy doesn't have to cause the rash. And use of soy milk, no, although she is feeding soy milk for whatever reason, but that's not the cause of the rash. So you're looking at a 19 year old who woke up with a painful blister and she's got an eruption all over her skin. It's involving multiple parts of the body and she was partying all night on the weekend. You notice that there are vesicles which are, or fluid filled vesicles which are larger than six millimeters. So they are very big. So technically speaking, they are bullet. So the question is asking, what is the diagnosis? So shingles, it's not shingles because it's not small vesicles, it's really big. Contact dermatitis, it's not that, although you can see small vesicles in addition to maculopapular rash in contact dermatitis in some people, but it's not contact dermatitis, it doesn't cause boy. Uh, psoriasis, psoriasis causes plaques, not the blisters, or not the, the bullet. Uh, bullet pemphigoid, that is the correct answer. It's big bullet involving multiple parts of the body. When you look at the differential diagnosis of bullet, the bullet pemphigus or pemphigus vulgaris or third degree skin burns, those are basically uh, parts of the differential diagnosis. So that is the diagnosis. Uh, the last uh, answer was, uh, or the choice was, can tell? Well, you can tell. This question is asking, how would you manage, manage this condition of bullous pemphigoid? So remember, bullous pemphigoid and pemphigus vulgaris, they are two uh, subtypes of the, of the condition called pemphigus, which is an autoimmune condition. Pemphigus vulgaris tends to be more serious, more acute, and has more problems associated with it, and more mortality and fatality. But bullous pemphigoid can also become very serious when multiple parts of the body or large areas are involved because of 
risk of dehydration. So generally speaking, it's a chronic condition where uh, it, uh, you can do outpatient treatment, but it can become a skin emergency if you are suspecting dehydration or large areas of the skin involvement. So the answer choice, uh, correct answer choice here would be B, which is prescribe steroids for this condition and possibly hospitalize the patient if large skin area is involved. There are additional, of course, treatment modalities uh, in the form of biologics and hydrate and other things. But uh, as far as the answer choices here are concerned, we'll pick B. We will not do just the answers. We will not do the oral antibiotics alone. We uh, at home, we we will not not do any treatment because that's not a wise thing to do and antihistamines will not have any role in this. A 49 year old female patient has an ulcer on the inner lip. It is as you can see on the inside of the lip it's not involving the mucocutaneous border and she's applied multiple ointments and over-the-counter things on it and uh, it's not helping, it's not healing, she doesn't have any other major medical problem. So the question is asking what makes you most suspicious that this is squamous cell cancer? Well, first of all, let's look at the ulcer itself. So it is since it's not involving the mucocutaneous border, it's probably not a herpes lesion. So now the question is what is it? Is it a benign lesion or a malignant lesion? Well, it could be benign. Most likely it is probably going to be benign because vast majority of these are going to be after ulcers. But in this particular scenario, uh, when we look at the patient and she says it's not healing, it's been going on for a long time, we should think about squamous cell cancer, especially given her um, age and possibly exposure to sunlight. Um, so the answer choices are the fact that she's a female. Well, that's not the answer because men also get squamous cell cancer with the same uh, or higher rate. The fact it's not healing, that is the correct answer, which is the answer choice B. She's 49 years old. old. Well, she's a little bit uh, on the, in the middle age group, but she's not very old to make her at a high risk. The location of the lesion is not necessarily consistent with squamous cell because squamous cell is more on the sun exposed areas uh, and the lack of pain is also not necessarily consistent with squamous cell because squamous cell cancer can cause pain when it involves the nerve endings or exposes the skin. So the correct uh, answer is going to be B. So a 63 year old patient is seeing you who he spent uh, quite a bit of time in Florida on the beaches. His father has a history of um, uh, of skin cancer and uh, he's uh, got an ulcer on his face that started about two months ago and now he's come to see you for advice. So the question is asking all of the following should make you suspicious um, of squamous cell cancer. In other words, are going to be parts of the risk factors associated with squamous cell cancer except for one. So did I mention Asian? So he is uh, so the answer choices are his age, well that should because he's 63, so he's in that right category for squamous cell cancer or skin cancer. His family history, that is the correct, uh, that, that is the risk factor, so not the correct answer. His ethnicity, that is the correct answer. So Asian population is not necessarily at any higher risk for squamous cell cancer. He's actually, he, uh, if Asian population is actually at lower risk for developing skin cancer compared to the um, white Caucasian population. Non-healing nature of the ulcer, that would be uh, a risk factor, so that's not the answer and sun exposure is a very big risk factor, so that is not the correct answer. So this question is a simple recall question and is asking uh, squamous cell cancer is most commonly metastasizing, uh, going to metastasize to which of the following uh, organs. So I'm not going to name all of them because they're all displayed on the screen. So the correct answer is going to be brain, bone, liver, and lung. So that is the your correct answer. So this particular patient has a very peculiar target lesion on, uh, on his limb. And the question is asking what could be the etiologic factor. So first we need to identify the lesion. We need to describe it and of course kind of try to click it with one of the differential diagnoses we have in our mind map. So the lesion is a target lesion you can see and it's erythematous macule essentially. So the name of the lesion is, if you, if you can recall from DSA is erythema multiforme. And erythema multiforme as the name suggests from multiforme can be from multiple reasons. So uh, the, the question is asking which of the following combination of 
uh, etiologies would be the uh, cause of this lesion. So we know that drugs and uh, virus infections can cause adenoma multiforme. Uh, that would be the correct answer. And then the rest of the answer choices are just simply not accurate because we know that they are not necessarily uh, involved in the development of target lesions. So this question is an, about a nine-year-old male patient who is brought by a mother and there is a, there is a lesion on his back. It's dark, it's black, uh, it's irregular. And mom uh, says that he's been playing in the outdoors quite a bit. He's non-Hispanic uh, white and there is no change in his activity or appetite. Although she hasn't noticed or monitored the progression of the lesion as such. The question is asking the only clinical feature that goes against the diagnosis of malignant melanoma in this particular patient is sun exposure. No, sun exposure is actually a very major risk factor for melanoma. Irregularity of the lesion, that is also a major risk factor or a feature consistent with melanoma. Ethnicity of the child, um, that is uh, also a feature or risk factor for melanoma. Age of the child, that is the correct answer. So the patient's age, young age, is going to basically place him at reverse risk or basically we are going to say that he's not at risk for melanoma because he's so young. Or absence of obvious illness. That's, uh, um, uh, that is not the correct answer because yeah, typically patients with melanoma don't have other illnesses or sicknesses. So this particular patient has a butterfly rash on the face and she has additional symptoms which basically make you suspect uh, lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus. So the question is asking uh, which of the following body systems are uh, likely to be involved in the long run. And as we know from DSA, uh, there are multiple systems. Lupus is a multi-system, multi-symptom disorder, so multiple systems could be involved. And uh, when we look at the combination choice, uh, choices, uh, we know that the nephrogenic system, which is the kidneys, uh, neurologic system, which is brain, and then uh, the um, musculoskeletal system is going to be involved. Uh, there are additional systems in the body, and of course, there are all kinds of abnormal labs that are going to be there that could be involved, but the rest of the combination uh, uh, as far as the choices are given in this uh, 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 question are not correct. So this is a simple recall question and when you look deeper there are so many symptoms that these systems can produce that the patient essentially has basically the disease all over the body. So a young 16 month old baby is brought to you by mom who's very concerned because the baby's got a rash all over the skin, it's on the face, it's weepy, it's oozy, it's uncomfortable, it's itchy, and um, this started to happen after mom switched uh, formula from, uh, from breast milk to formula, and the child is quite uncomfortable, but there is no fever. So you make the correct diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, because that is what it is. And now the question is asking, what advice should you give to the mom? Well, you should immediately buy new clothes, new lotion, new bedding. Mm -mm, that's not the answer because those probably don't have much to do with this rash. Breastfeeding should be resumed and formula should be completely discontinued. Mm, no, one could think about that, but that's not the correct answer because uh, we don't know if that caused it. Also, uh, there might be some reason why mom switched to formula, so we probably need to look at that too. Most of the time, one single cause can be established for atopic dermatitis. Reverse is true, atopic dermatitis is a multifactorial disorder and uh, we can't establish a diagnosis or can't establish one causative agent. Gene environment interaction plays a critical role in the development of this condition. That is the correct answer, answer D because it is a combination of genes, there is genetic mutations, there is environmental exposure, and when the two combine, uh, then uh, patients do develop atopic dermatitis or atopy. So it's in the form of atopy, eczema, rash, rhinitis, allergies, it could be as there could be asthma too. And in the beginning, as you refer back to DSA, there's going to be um, atopic dermatitis in the form of oozy, VP rash, and then later on they develop eczema. 
A 25-year-old medical student has developed a rash in both hands and he noticed it since he started to work in the anatomy lab. His friend said, well, go ahead and wash your hands more frequently, maybe it'll go away. But in fact, uh, he, when he did that, it got progressively worse, more itchy, more oozy, and he's quite a bit uncomfortable. So let's see what it is. So when you explain this rash to the patient uh, and explain the mechanism of this rash, because he's a medical student, so you've got to explain everything to him, um, you conclude that Answer, answer choice A, it is a type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity reaction to latex allergy. That is the correct answer if you refer back to DSA. Latex allergy is contact dermatitis and happens as a result of combination of type 1 and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. Or is it a, it's a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction? We know it's not that. It's a late onset atopic dermatitis. It's not that either. It's a dishydrotic dermatitis. Uh, which happens in dry heat in anatomy lab it's not that and of course it's a hygiene issue mm -mm. we don't say that to medical students so a 27 year old male patient is seeing you for cosmetic procedures so you do cosmetic procedures in your office and he's got quite a quite a few lesions on his face and he's particularly concerned because he's thinking he's not sure if laser treatment will help with this condition so the question is asking which of the following is considered to be predisposing or pathogenetic factors in the development of this condition. So as you look at the patient's skin, you can conclude that this is actually rosacea. So rosacea is considered to be an unfortunate condition where the rash or the lesions are going to be in the central part of the face and there is quite a bit of redness, there is quite a bit of uh, maculopapular um, vesicle, uh, lesions and there is more importantly there is going to be uh, dysmorphic skin and in, in, uh, in the nose area that is called rhinophyma. So looking at the pictures, this patient is rhinophyma, rosacea and what is the underlying pathogenetic uh, or uh, predisposing uh, factors. So the first answer is immune dysregulation, immune system dysregulation, vascular hyperactivity, microorganisms, for example, mite or fungi or even bacteria, ultraviolet radiations, or all of the above. The correct answer is all of the above. So when you refer back to the DSA, you'll see it's all of these uh, factors. So the next question is uh, basically asking uh, about the same patient. He's got a rash, he's got multiple lesions on his skin in the form of rosacea, there is rhinophyma and he's thinking about laser treatment and this time he's asking another question. So the question is asking which of the following is an effective treatment option? Laser, antibiotics, bremonidine, which is a medicine that helps with the rosacea or redness of the rosacea. Um, that is the correct answer and the additional choices or other choices are surgery and fungal well, surgery is not necessary antibiotics bremonidine or vitamin e that doesn't have any role uh, bremonidine steroids or evermectin although evermectin is um, considered to be an effective treatment option or a part of the treatment option but steroids are not uh, or all of the above it's not all of the above the correct answer is a the next question, this question is asking about what of, which of the following statements is correct regarding correlation of diet with exacerbation of acne symptoms. So there's all kinds of viewpoints and there's all kinds of previous data, but the latest data has at least some answer. So the answer choices are diet plays no role. We all know everybody who's got acne ever in life knows diet has a role. Uh, whole food, plant-based diet exacerbates acne symptoms no no it doesn't a diet high in sugar dairy and meat products exacerbate symptoms that is the correct answer because uh, there is a lot of burden of diet this type of diet on the body and it will exacerbate acne symptoms or diet plays a role only if the patient reacts to specific dietary products in the form of ige mediated allergy that is not correct so the answer is c which is diet high in sugar or uh, or dairy or meat products. So this question is asking about a 62 year old patient who's got a scaly spot on his forehead and the question is asking which of the following statements is correct about this condition. So there are multiple choices and as you see the scaly spot on the forehead in this age group in the, in the 
on the sun exposed area is consistent with actinic keratosis so the answer choices are genetics sun exposure and immune dysfunction um, these three things are basically going to be predisposing factors that is the correct answer or this condition never leads to cancer that's not right it is a precancerous condition or there is a specific predilection to interferogenous areas which is basically axillas and folds and the groin area that's not correct it is actually going to be more on the sun exposed areas keratotic lesions tend to form sinus tracts and metastasize no they never form sinus tracts and they don't metastasize they can lead to cancer but they don't necessarily do the metastasis so the correct answer is a this so this question is asking uh, about 29 year old female patient who's come to see you she's got a rash it comes and goes it, it comes on out of nowhere um, although diet may have a role to play and it goes away after a few days. It's very pruritic. She's very uncomfortable. This one is showing on her elbow. Sometimes it's on her knees, on her legs. But the question is asking which of the following is associated with this condition. So when you look at the rash, look at the clinical picture, look at the history. Um, this is dermatitis herpetic formus. So the question is asking what is uh, related to this. Um, so the first answer is gluten and sun exposure. Although gluten is associated with dermatitis herpetiformis because this is a rash of celiac disease, but sun exposure is not. Dairy and joint pain. Well, dairy is not associated with dermatitis herpetiformis or celiac disease, although people may develop allergy or sensitivity to dairy. Travel history and fever. Mm -mm, that's not the answer. Gluten and HLA, DQ2, and DQ8 alleles. So there is a strong genetic predisposition uh, in these patients who have alleles HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. When they eat gluten, they develop gluten sensitivity. As a result, they have developed celiac disease and they develop this rash called uh, dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, the last, and so that is the correct answer, D. The last is none of the above, that's not the correct answer. The question is asking which of the following conditions is associated with acantholysis, which is basically separation between dermis and epidermis when you rub the skin or apply any pressure on the surface of the skin and the skin basically just separates. So uh, of all the answer choices, the correct answer is pemphigus, especially pemphigus vulgaris and the sign is called Nikolsky sign. So what happens is whenever you apply pressure or uh, try to rub the skin, the skin will peel off in severe condition where uh, pemphigus is basically active. Um, the other choices are not correct. Of course, we know in eczema it doesn't happen. People can scratch because they uh, just have a lot of um, itching and pruritus associated with eczema, but they don't necessarily peel off their skin. Um, the rest of the answer choices, uh, atopic dermatitis, which is a form of eczema, is also not correct. Uh, psoriasis is another condition where people can have a lot of itching associated with this with this but um, the condition does not lead to separation of the dermis from the epidermis so acantholysis is not uh, going to be uh, present there and uh, lastly um, scabies which we didn't even discuss in the in the dsc or plm which is a condition where people just have itching does not lead to separation of skin and epidermis from dermis this question is about color of skin and skin of color uh, and is asking regarding evaluating skin uh, conditions from diverse backgrounds which of the following statements is correct for patients who have Fitzpatrick 5 or 6 skin type so they have darker skin color so when you refer back to DSA you can see that starting from Fitzpatrick skin type A all the way to 6 the color darkens so the question is asking um, in, in those darker skin colors Erythematous lesions may look more red. So the red looks more red. Is that the answer? No, we know that's not correct. Or red lesions may look more gray. That is the correct answer. Erythematous lesions may look more gray, violaceous. Um, Erythematous lesions may puncture easily. That's not correct because they don't necessarily ulcerate or puncture. Uh, Erythematous lesions may be more confluent. That's not correct answer. They may be confluent on, in any skin type or it does not make any difference. That's not the correct answer either because we know that there is going to be a difference in appearance of these lesions. So the correct answer choice is B. 
This question is asking when we are evaluating different patients uh, for skin lesions, uh, for fish patterns skin type 4 or higher or darker skin color, which of the statements is correct? So lesions may not follow a typical geographical distribution. That is the correct answer because as we know that there are some skin conditions where uh, the lesions may be in different parts of the body when compared to non-black or a lighter skin color and we'll talk about that lesions may bleed easily that's not correct so darker skin doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be more bleeding uh, they may respond to treatment more quickly that's not correct uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation does not occur actually reverse is true post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation occurs a lot or all of the above statements are correct that is not correct either um, so the the answer choice a is correct which means that the typical geographical distribution is not necessarily followed and two examples of this would be eczema which normally in uh, in uh, lighter skin color the distribution is going to be in the flexural areas in not the extensive surfaces in darker skin color it will be on the extensive surfaces also um, the other example would be melanoma uh, which is typically not found on palms and soles of feet but in darker skin color it will be there also so those are the examples and the correct choices uh, a so in this particular patient, you have a lesion on the side of the finger, which is basically painful. You see a small vesicle and you see a little bit of edema or redness around the lesion. And the question is what exactly it is. So it's a very interesting question, a very good uh, case because you'll see it quite often. So patients will come in with all kinds of lesions. So when you look at the side of the lesion and look examine closely, the characteristic findings are that the patient has uh, pain it's red and there is a vesicle so when you see vesicle go back to um, go back to the differential diagnosis for vesicles and one of those differential diagnoses is uh, her herpes simplex virus or herpetic lesion um, so uh, the fact that it is painful and there is a vesicle involved will say that it is probably herpes so herpetic with low would be the correct answer the other uh, things that are associated with vesicles as you already know are going to be possibly a herpes zoster infection. The patient is too young for that and it's not in a dermatome distribution. The other option could be um, uh, uh, atopic dermatitis or severe uh, eczema where patients scratch and vesicles may form. But as you can see that the distribution of lesion is not widespread. It's not that wide and there is no itching associated uh, in this particular condition, so patient is an eye aging. So when we see all of that combined with the fact that there is pain, pain is the differentiating factor. Pain is there, itching is not there. So then, therefore, it is herpetic with low and not eczema or other things. So the last question is about COVID-19. So this uh, the question is asking in multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children or Miss C, uh, secondary to COVID-19. Uh, all the following systems of the body have been involved except for one and which one is that and that is the one that we don't know yet maybe in future we'll find out that that is also involved because after all it's a multi-system problem but anyway so far we don't know that that system is involved so the answer choices are neurologic system skin uh, and soft tissue respiratory system gastrointestinal system or genital urinary system so the correct answer which is not involved in this uh, uh, syndrome is the genital urinary system or the answer choice E. So you can refer back to your DSA and you'll see more information over there. So students, this concludes our PLM. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me, reach out. I'm happy to, uh, to engage with you. Uh, the, again, like I said, the best way to use this material would be to go through all the questions, pause at multiple points, answer the questions yourself, uh, test your knowledge, and if there is any confusion or comments, feel free to reach out. Um, go ahead and go back to DSS slides. Those are inserted throughout the uh, PowerPoint presentation also, and uh, refer to them to see if you need to get more uh, information about the conditions. Uh, if there is any typos or errors, then also please do let me know, uh, and I'm hoping that this is uh, uh, this was a useful exercise for you. Thank you.